Thanks for coming. I appreciate you spending the time with us today. And uh, again, thanks to B&H for having me here. Um, as Deb said, my name's Eric Stoner. I've heard all of the comments before about my last name, so you can't hit me with anything that I haven't heard already. <laughs> so uh, what I will say is um, a little bit of background on me. I've been a photographer for 29 years now professionally. And I know I look pretty good right now, right? So, uh, but I started really, 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 really young. And this is all I know, so it better work out. Uh, but I started obviously in the film era and witnessed the whole transition uh, from film to digital and everything in between, scanning negatives, and, and you know, I've been through a lot of that. Uh, and you know, the one thing I think that we're at, at Canon that we're all about is education. And the, you, know, you can never stop learning. And the, when you think you've learned it all, you might as well just check out because there's so much more that you can learn every day. I mean, all, I use this term a lot, all of us are smarter than one of us. And you can always learn something from just being in a group of people that you've never met before. So um, I encourage that a lot. So anyway, um, today we're gonna be talking about headshots. So this is kind of a basic class to get you started. And you know, I had a conversation earlier with uh, a gentleman in the second row here about dealing with people. And that's one of the hardest aspects of being a portrait photographer is finding that connection between you and your subject. And not everybody can do it. Uh, and it, it, you know, I used to be very, very shy in high school. And people look at me now, they said, there's no way. Well, as soon as you put 600 screaming kids in elementary school in front of you that you have to photograph throughout the whole day, you get over that shyness quickly because you have to keep things on a schedule. So I did that, uh, you know, a lot, and that brought me out of my shell. So I don't necessarily recommend that you go do that because it's it's like sticking needles in your eyes. But uh, it's it, it did bring me out into an area where I can then pretty much talk to anybody and find that common ground with anybody I'm photographing, and it and it it helps tremendously with having. Uh, a good rapport with your subject. And sometimes you only have a rapport for a couple of minutes, maybe not even that. You know, there have been times when I've, I, I live in the, the Philadelphia region, so uh, when I really got heavy into headshots, uh, when digital first really started rearing its, its, uh, itself as a viable, educa or viable um, method of making money, I decided to go into uh, some of the high rises in Philadelphia and just canvas uh, myself there and, and, and spread the word about headshots. And I, you know, I've had people say to me, he's a very important man and you've got five minutes with him. Okay, I can do that. Well, this speaks about being prepared for the job that you're gonna do. Uh, and so we're gonna get into it. Uh, but you don't always have a lot of time is basically the message. So you have to be prepared for everything. So again, we're going to be talking about headshots today, and the, again, the basics of today is really designed with uh, one light in mind. And you can do a lot with one light, and I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we're going to do. Um, no, you know, like it, demo shooting that we're going to be doing today, but there's, a, there's a, a secondary class that I'm going to do probably in July here on advanced headshots. So that will probably involve some more, you know, on you know, live shooting and stuff like that. So anyway, um, so who needs a headshot? Actually, before I start with that, how many of you are currently doing headshots in the room? Raise your hands, hi, let me see. Okay, about, about a third of you, maybe? Okay, um, challenges that you're having? Posing. Yell them out. Posing. Posing. Getting people in front of my camera. Getting people in front of your camera, okay. There's a lot we can talk about with that. Anybody else? White background. White background? Light. Lighting on the background. OK, all right. All right, all stuff that we can handle. I haven't heard anything we can't, we can't handle yet. Anybody else have any like things that you're having trouble with? OK, all right. Well, those are pretty easy. We can take care of a lot of those. Uh, so, so who needs headshots? Everybody. OK, well, actors. I mean, like, let's get specific. Actors, right? We're in New York. There's a lot of actors here. Models, everybody loves photographing models. Okay. Business professionals. 
okay? Uh, the general public, like you guys said in the beginning, everybody needs a headshot. So that really opens up the market to be huge. So if everybody needs a headshot, especially with social media these days, even if you don't plan on having it be a, like a professional business headshot for making a living, you still would benefit from having a really good headshot. No? So, uh, so those are some of the things I think that, that, are, that are important. So we're gonna, I'm just going to kind of give you a quick overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, first thing, we're going to take a look at, at styles and um, of light basically on the face. How, how do you light your subject? And it's going to be different for, like, depending on who you're photographing. I'm not going to use the same lighting on, on, on uh, somebody that maybe perhaps has a lot of blemishes or texture in their skin than I would with somebody who's got perfect skin. So those are things that you know, you're know you going to change the lighting depending on a lot of those things. And also, feedback from the person you're photographing. What kind of mood do they want in their, in their image? You know, you don't want to go in and do like a, an executive business portrait for a model if that's not what she's looking for. So you have to get a little bit of feedback from your, from your, your client. Uh, we'll talk about some of the basic gear. And again, we're, basically you need a camera and a light and maybe a reflector. Those are pretty <laughs> simple things. Uh, we'll talk about basic wireless setup on uh, our Canon speed light system. Uh, but you can obviously do this with just about any light that's available. Even window light is, a, is a, one of the perfect uh, scenarios for doing uh, that if you don't have any lights. On-camera flash techniques, you're thinking, okay, why would I want to do on-camera? That's the worst possible light ever. Well, in a way, yes. However, most on-camera flashes have the ability to bounce. So if you don't have a secondary transmitting unit, you can bounce off a lot of things and still create really beautiful light. And I have some examples that I'll show you that. And then uh, we're going to talk about, of course, off-camera, which is really the best scenario because getting the light off of camera or at least the appearance of it getting off camera allows you to create shadows. And when you create shadows, you create depth. That's what you want in a portrait. You want some, in, in, in most cases, there are other reasons to really flatten the light out for different purposes. So I don't want to say this way is the only way, but it's a very good method. Okay, and then we'll talk a little bit about business. We're, this isn't a whole lot. Uh, this class isn't really designed to talk about how to go out and get them, but we'll we'll touch on some of those things just to whet your appetite a little bit. Okay, and so this image coming up right now, I want you to look at it and tell me what camera was used. Anybody? Can anybody tell me? A Canon. Good. Cool. That's great. You're awesome. You're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe was it a 5DSR or maybe perhaps, oh, you know, it's a 1DX, right? You're like Columbo. <laughs> no, it, it was this camera. This is a Canon PowerShot uh, G5X. It, it's an, an amazing camera, but the sensor is smaller, uh, but you don't need a big sensor camera to do this kind of work because it's all about, um, have you ever heard of the expression pixels per face instead of pixels per inch? Have you ever heard that? Okay, so let's just take a, if I take a shot of somebody in the back of the room with a full frame camera and a 50 millimeter lens, we'll just keep everything pretty simple. The number of pixels that I would count on that person's face are a whole lot less then if I come up to you, what's your name? Camille. Camille? Yeah. Okay, if I come up to you and I photograph you from this distance, how many pixels are, is your face covering across that sensor? A lot more, right? So it's just, have you, have you ever looked at a billboard up close? Yeah. They look horrible. They're all pixelated, but it's all about viewing distance. So pixel, we, when we talk about pixels per face, you have a whole lot more pixels per face at that, with that last image that you just saw than you do with somebody that's further away. So you don't need a, a huge sensor camera to make this a, a viable tool to work with. It's nice to have a full frame 5DSR or a 1DX or something like that, but it's not absolutely necessary. What is necessary uh, if you're going to use any kind of flash or strobe is a hot shoe, okay, up here. 
that you're going to need. Whether you have on-camera flash or you put a transmitter like the STE3 transmitter, which will trigger your off-camera flash, something like that. You're going to need that. Now, if, you're, if your camera doesn't have a hot shoe, what are your options? Anybody? Well, if it doesn't have a hot shoe and if it doesn't, let's just assume it doesn't have a, a sync cord either, if it doesn't have a hot shoe. Continuous lighting. Continuous lighting, okay, that's an option. Window light. Um, so there are options available, but uh, they, they limit, you're limiting it at that point. But you can certainly use continuous light for sure. Um, so you don't need a, a, a full HDSLR to make this work. I would suggest if, if, if you don't have uh, a viable you know, full-frame DSLR or even an APS-C size Kent sensor, which is a crop sensor like a 7D Mark II or even a Rebel like T5i, T6i, T7i, something like that, you, any of those cameras will work, but this is totally fine. Okay? Now I have to put any nice Canon power shot will do. All right? Okay, now. Um, Many types of lighting and different, you know, types and styles that we'll talk about. Now, there's no one perfect way to do anything. And the answer in everything that I say in, in photography, the answer to everything in photography is it depends. The answer depends a lot about who you're photographing, what equipment is available, what kind of time you have at your, at your disposal. So let's talk about it. So when I say hard lighting, what, what, they might tell me what hard lighting is. Anybody know? Harsh. Harsh. Not diffused. Not diffused, okay. What's it look like? like? A lot of shadows. Shadows, right. So we create dimension with shadows. Without shadows, you don't have much dimension. That's why a lot of um, you know, cameras that have the flash right next to the lens, uh, if you're like on-camera flash, that looks just like a snapshot for the most part because there's very little dimension in shadowing. Okay, so this is what hard light looks like, all right? Pretty girl, yeah, great, but how do we know it's a hard light just by looking at what we're seeing right now? Shadow edge. Shadow edge, okay, right in here you can tell. Look at that hard edge shadow. It's just like the sun is shining and like if you were to be walking outside and you have a real hard edge shadow on the sidewalk, you know that's hard lighting. And you can have hard lighting from a soft light source. Why? Distance from the subject. Okay, the sun is this little point in the sky. It's very far away. And so the size relative to, of that relative to your subject is what makes the light hard. So if I take a, one of these, these uh, continuous light source that's illuminating me right now, and I put it all the way across the store and shine it at me, I'm going to have a fairly hard-edged shadow from that soft light. If I move close to that light, things begin to change. I'm not saying this is wrong, but I'm just showing you this is an example of what it looks like. So hard edge shadows. Soft lighting. Way different than the last image, right? We've got beautiful soft light. Does it make it right? Not necessarily. It depends on what the mood we're looking for. Uh, so, but in this image, right, we've, the transition from highlight to shadow is very smooth. Uh, so the gradient from highlight to shadow is, is very uh, subtle, okay? And this is great. You heard me mention earlier about uh, folks that may particularly have some, um, some type of like, you know, they've got a lot of texture in their face or perhaps, uh, um, you know, pock marks or something from their earlier years in life when they had a lot of acne or whatever when they were a kid. Those types of things are really, when you look at somebody and begin to analyze what type of light you're going to use with them, uh, soft light will hide a lot of those particular uh, imperfections. Now, yeah, of course, you can go in and retouch all that stuff, but I'm a big fan of getting it right in the camera as best as I can before I have to do any post-production work. Because I hate sitting in front of the computer retouching this and retouching that. Yeah, retouching is a, a necessary evil uh, for me, anyway, I'll call it evil because I, I would rather shoot than retouch. It's just my thing. I'm a photographer, not a retouching artist. But so that will, will help. Now you'll notice uh, on some of the shots I'll show you in a little while. This particular model has some texture to her skin, and you, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that on the monitor here. Uh, you can kind of see it on this shot. So this is called Rembrandt lighting. Anybody ever hear of this before? 
Okay, uh, it's very common. Uh, where and the reason why we see we they call it that is Rembrandt obviously was very popular with this type of lighting. You see this little triangle of light on the on the shadow side of the face, and that's very indicative of that style of lighting. Split lighting, the light basically is coming from one side hitting the other, and really the only the only way we're seeing detail on this side of the face is because there's a reflector on the other side of there. If I took that reflector away, that side of the face will go completely black. I'm not suggesting that this is a, a common style of lighting, but let's just say you're doing maybe a, a headshot for a musician and they want something really kind of dark. There's a reason to use that. Depend the answer again to, to everything is it depends on what you're photographing. All right. This is again directly from the left and then reflector fill. Okay, loop lighting. Anybody ever hear of this? Anybody know why it's called loop lighting? Yeah, yeah. You're a rock star. Come on up. You're going to teach the rest of this. Okay, so yeah, basically the, the light is up high and to the left on this model, and then you'll notice that the shadow is in the shape of a loop on the, from the nose there. That's loop lighting. And the closest, the, the cheek that's closest to the camera uh, is in shadow, that side. This is also called short lighting, if you've ever heard of that. <coughs> Thins out the face. Who, you know, one thing, what do we hear as photographers constantly from people that we're going to photograph? Can you take 10 pounds off or, or 50 pounds off or whatever? You know, B&H needs to make a filter that they sell here that just <laughs> does that. That would be great. But, you know, and they, I forget what show it was, but somebody were talking about a group of people, and they said, you know, well, the, oh, the camera adds 10 pounds, and the guy says, well, how many cameras are actually on you? I know, right? You would never say that to a woman. Guys, we can handle that kind of stuff because it's expected. But anyway, uh, when you start carving out shadows in your subject, that's when you start being able to control uh, how a person looks with regards to weight. Uh, <clears throat> clothing is another huge, huge um, area you want to discuss about before the subject gets in front of your camera. If, if they have some weight issues that they're concerned about, and, and it's, it's always great to be open with your subject. Ask them ahead of time, if you have the opportunity, what are some of the things that bother you when you have seen yourself in a photograph? It's a perfectly fair question. And some people may be embarrassed to say, oh, man, I've got this, you know, this double chin here, or, or they, they won't tell you. Um, but if you explain to them, it is in their best interest to share with, some of those con share with you some of those concerns because you can address that in the session. And they will thank you after the fact. So that's, we usually call that a clothing consultation, but you, you address some of these other issues and fears. I mean, let's face it. When there's a camera on you, what, what, what do most people do? It's uncomfortable. It's not a natural thing to have a camera on you. And so anytime you can, and this, part, this is what goes into to talking about rapport with your subject. When you relax them, everything becomes so much easier. And then you know the face relaxes, and they are who they really are. And that's when they start saying, you know, I love that picture of me. So. Really, it's like 90% psychology. Have you heard of this before? F portrait photography? It really is. So, okay, back to it. Broad lighting, and this is not meant as, as a sexist way. It's, it is, broad lighting means that the cheek that's closest to the camera has the light on it. So, different from the last image where her face was turned the other direction, um, this is going to add weight to a subject. Now. In most cases, this is not necessarily the most flattering light, uh, but there are people with very narrow faces that this could be a good uh, lighting pattern for them because they don't, you know, maybe someone will say, my face always looks like, you know, everything's sunken in. You know, if somebody is willing to share that with you, then you can address that issue because you may not know those issues. So, again, less flattering, uh, adds weight to you a little bit, depending on, you know, who you are. And then, of course, again, the cheek closest to the camera has the light on it. Okay, butterfly lighting. Anybody seen this before? This is really popular with headshots for like actors and models and stuff like that. It's it's a fairly flattering type, glamorous type of lighting, 
and usually you'll end up seeing um, a reflector from underneath where you've got one light straight overhead of your subject and a reflector underneath. It's very simple but elegant type lighting. So lit from above, shadow falls under, right under the nose there. Uh, you want to be careful at how high you put the light because if there's no catch lights in the eye, anybody know what a catch light is? Anybody not know? It's okay if you don't, we're in a learning situation here. So a catch light is basically the reflection from the actual light source. So if you see right in here, you see the little white light. That's, you can see a catch light on me right now if you look from the lights here. Uh, if that is gone, if you don't have catch lights in the eyes, the eyes die and so does the portrait, in my opinion. Now again, the answer to everything is it depends. So if you're looking for that kind of dark, dreary uh, look, then there's maybe, there's always a reason to break the rule. But in general, if that light is too high and you can't see a catch light in the eye, bring it down. You could put the lens literally right underneath the light and you'll know you'll get, you'll get a ref, uh, reflection in the eye, a catch light. It is more glamorous. Again, this particular shot there was no uh, reflector and I can tell that by the fact of the, the, the density in the shadow underneath. There's really, it's, it's a deeper shadow. And all photography lighting is basically just the ability to control contrast. That's all it is. Okay. Any questions on that so far? We good? All right. Tools you're going to need. We talked about this a little bit already. They're very going to be fairly simple. Any Canon camera will do. Okay. All right. Uh, a portrait lens. This again. This is a little. Uh, this is my feeling on portraits. Okay. Uh, yes, people can do portraits with a 35 millimeter or a 24 millimeter, but it's probably not as common. Again, depending on what you're doing. Uh, but in most cases, anywhere between 85 and 135 is a really good range for portraits. And this lens here, the 70 to 200, which is, this is my number one go-to lens for, for a lot of stuff. And it's probably the, well it is, the best selling lens amongst the pros because it, it's, it's the workhorse. It does a lot of stuff for you and it's well worth it. But you don't need that. You could get a 135. You could get an 85. You could even do it with a 50 millimeter if you wanted to. It's, it's going to be working distance from you to your subject. If, I get a, if I'm trying to photograph um, you, sir, what's your name? Jin. If I'm going to photograph you in the first row uh, and I'm with a 50 millimeter lens, I got to be, to get a, a, you know, a head shot of you, I got to be pretty close, right? Now, what happens when you have a lens on you that's really close? It's psychologically, you're going to be like, you know, you know, I need my personal space here. Yeah. So that becomes something, and I'm not saying that everybody will be uncomfortable, but the, I'm a big fan of, of um, telephoto lenses. I like to get further back from my subject. Why? I end up, photo, I photograph a lot of children. And when you, what's the first thing you do when you put a camera on a child? What do they do? <laughs> Touch it, nice. Yeah, that's one thing, you know, the big thumb right on the lens, that's happened. But, but generally, when a camera is on a child, and child, you know, children can have headshots too, what's the first thing they do? What do they say? Cheese. And you get that fake smile and that, and that contrived look. And for me, like, how many photographs do you need of that kid between the ages of you know, 1 and 18 with them saying the same thing, cheese, and coming up with that fake smile? All right, I, I want a picture of a child that is real. Them acting and, and having an expression, a real expression, so that a, when a parent looks at that, they go, that's my kid. You know, so school pictures is not that vehicle because everybody, again, doing 600 photographs a day of kids, geez, you know, it, it's, it just, you can't get around it. Anyway, but it, this, this range, 85 to 135, is, is probably a really good range for portraits. One, uh, because uh, you, you get, if you have a plain background, it's not going to matter so much. But if you're doing headshots where you've got some sort of texture or maybe there's an environmental, uh, like, a, like an office or something, and, the, and somebody wanted a headshot like in their office. And, but you don't want the background to be super sharp. You want just 
what's back there? Oh, I can tell it's an office, but it's out of focus, and that's good because you want the focus to go to where? Face. Right. Your eye goes to two main areas when you look at an image. Can anybody tell me what they are? Eyes. Eyes. Brightest. Who said brightest part? Okay, you're on the right track. Area of greatest contrast. Yes, give that man a prize. Uh, and there's one other. Area of sharpest focus. It's, it's natural. Your eyes, have you ever, I'm, I'm a big fan of watching movies and seeing how the, um, the cinematography is done. And generally, whoever's talking has the focus. And your eye will naturally gravitate to whoever is in focus. So let's just say there's, uh, let's say there's, there's guys in a, in a car and they're, photogra they're, they're photographing it from the side window and they're talking back and forth. But you can see both of them. Whoever's, wh whoever's got the focus usually is talking, but that's where your eye goes. Focus. Now, you've heard of Ansel Adams before, yes? Okay. Anybody? Okay. All right. I know. So uh, almost everything in Ansel Adams' photographs were in focus. So he w was challenged with, all right, so if I take that concept of sh greatest uh, contrast and sharpest focus, sharpest focus is already, at, like everything's in focus, so now what? Greatest contrast. And that was all he had to work with was greatest contrast. And that was what made him a genius because he, he waited and waited and waited for the right time of day to take that photograph. And, of course, a lot of post-processing, I'll say post-processing, I'll say darkroom work, all right, because post-processing didn't even exist really electronically back in his day. So uh, those are some, some great keys. So area of sharpest focus and area of greatest contrast. All right. You need a, at least a speed light, or you could do window light. Come on in, have a seat. Are there any open seats anywhere? Just kind of pop in. Uh, so I say a speed light because it's really easy to travel with. You don't need more than that. Of course, you could do a window, but I'm, today we're mainly going to talk about <coughs> speed lights, or we could talk about uh, you know, any kind of strobe where the, the, the actual exposure is very short. OK. A light modifier. Generally, in most cases, you'd want some sort of modifier affecting how that light is coming out of the speed light. Now, if you look at the speed light, this is very similar to hard light, right? It's, it's like the sun. It's a pinpoint in the sky. It's a very small light source. But where you take this and point it or put a modifier in front of it can change dramatically the light source size. And that's where that really comes into play. So I'll, let me go back here real quick. A couple of light modifiers that, that I really like. One of my favorites is this Westcott Halo. I love that because it's basically a shoot-through umbrella with a, a back that, that has a lot of silver lining inside of it. So you, you're maximizing all the light going forward instead of shooting through an open umbrella where you're getting some bounce back in the back where nobody is. It's a waste of light. Uh, but that light in particular has been one of my go-to lights for forever, and you can do a lot with it. Now, also, you have some of this, like the, the Westcott Apollo Orb. That's more like window light, and I'll share with you some of the quality differences you'll see uh, in, in imagery here that we have. And then, of course, if you really don't have room for those two, you've got things like this, like the Rogue uh, Flashbender system, which they're fairly small. You have to be fairly close to your subject with them, but that's okay as long as they're not in the picture you're good. Reflector. Reflectors are almost a, a, a necessary thing when you're photographing people. Um, unless you're really into contrasty work, reflectors will be a big savior for you. And there's, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, I don't necessarily recommend one over the other, uh, but you know, there's one thing, one thing I will say is I never use a gold reflector, or solid gold. It's, unless you're photographing, you know, for SI and you're doing a swimsuit issue, um, gold is horrible for the skin. You would think, oh, it warms it up, it's nice, but it's, too, it's overly warm. It's, it's gone too far. Um, one of my favorites is the California Sun Bounce because it has a zebra silver gold fabric. 
It's one of the best I've ever seen, and it, it does a great job. But any, virtually any reflector, silver, white, a mixture of that, those two, or even you could use a translucent material. You can go as far as to say, you know what, I don't have a whole lot of money for that stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you in here, this program, the, a simple white shower curtain is a tremendously great light modifier. And of course, the backdrop. Whether that backdrop is environmental, like I already mentioned, or a simple white wall, or any type of canvas, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter uh, as long as it's in key with whatever you're trying to do with what the photograph is about. Uh, and white is very common because it's just, it, it, there's nothing in the background, it's very plain, you're, it brings your eye right to the subject. Okay. Now, a uh, couple quick things on Speedlight Basics. Uh, I'm going to talk about this, the 600 EXRT. That's the flagship Canon model. But, um, so there's two main exposure modes, ETTL, which is automatic flash. I use that a lot. And people will say to me, how come you don't use manual? Uh, you know, I'm a photographer. I've got to use everything in manual. OK, there's validity to that, where you know exactly the power you're getting out of your flash every single time. Uh, but ETTL with this system does a really good job. And as long as you know what to expect and how ETTL works, it works basically just like, um, you know, there's a pre-flash that goes off and then the camera's metering system reads that pre-flash before the exposure happens. And if I'm photographing you in the front row and you've got a black shirt on, which you do, that's going to affect the exposure that ETTL will give versus if I had somebody in a white top. That's going to affect the exposure. And all you control that through um, the exposure compensation, the flash exposure compensation button. And so once that's set, as long as your subject is, you know, fairly stagnant in, this, in the scene, it's not going to vary too, too much. So that's, I use ETTL until it gives me a reason not to use it. And then, so if my exposures are all over the place because the subject is moving and the actual predominant color uh, it, either dark or light or somewhere in between is, is changing drastically and I need consistency, then I'll go to manual. So there's always a reason to do both. So manual flash, again, you're getting the same output every single time. And if you are into that, that's fine. However, I photograph a lot of children. They're moving all over the place. That's the beauty of ETTL because the exposure changes depending on the distance. If, I, if my flash to subject distance changes, and I'm in manual mode, my exposure is going to change with it. So let's just say this is my light panel right here. And my, I, I've set my lights for exposure to be perfect right here. But if that kid moves back over here, I've just doubled that distance and I've lost a ton of light. And so now I've got to go in and fix that in post, which I hate doing. So ETTL works great for a lot of those situations. If your subject's sitting on a, on a stool in front of you, no reason why you can't use manual if you're dealing with somebody that's not going to move around and change that distance from the subject to the flash. So again, same similar way of controlling, it, just use the plus minus uh, exposure button there and that will change you know, uh, from 1 1 28th power all the way up to full power, one to one. And it's very simple. And you can control all of that from the transmitter right in the camera. Okay, here's again what the back of it looks like. Um, all you have to do to get into, we're going to talk about wireless real quick. Uh, if you're doing off camera, I'll just a quick setup for that, you're going to press this wireless button here highlighted with the yellow square. And then you just basically, uh, the first option that will come up will be all, meaning all the lights that are out there, whether they're in group A, B, C, D, or E, or they're all going to attempt to fire at equal power. But since we're only working with one light today, doesn't matter. You can keep it in all, and you can change the light intensity uh, through exposure compensation or dialing in the manual power. One thing that's really interesting, uh, since Canon has the radio uh, triggering system built into their lights, uh, it, it works really, really well. Now, when you go into a, a, an urban environment like New York City, uh, you're, since you're working with radio frequencies, things can change drastically depending on what's around you. If you're near, you know, if somebody's using a microwave in the area, that changes how things, uh, how 
the transmitting actually, uh, the strength of that transmitting works. So you have this little scan button here, and this is the, one of the coolest things I love about this system. You've got 15 channels to choose from, and you hit that scan button, and then it, it does a scan of all 15 channels, and it'll come back with this graph and tell you, okay, which of these channels is the most powerful right now? And you can use whatever one you want there. So that's really nice. Uh, and, and you'll rarely get this many in New York City. It won't look like this. If you're in a, if you're in a, in a rural environment or even a suburb, usually they're all pretty good. But uh, this is a nice thing to have. Okay. And then for added security, let's just say you pick one of the 15 channels and you're in an environment where there's other photographers working with the same lights as you, okay, the same Canon speed lights, and you're... You, let's just say channel four was the strongest one and all the other ones are garbage. And so you've, you've limited, now all these photographers are using channel four, now what? You know, your lights are gonna be, they're gonna be triggering your lights, you're gonna be triggering their lights. So we've added this little, it's a four digit pin or an ID. So that was basically, it's, it's the unlock code for, for your camera to say, all right, I've got my own, you can pro program whatever number you want in there from one to 9,999 and that's your area, even if you're on the same channel. It's a little security pin. So, but all of your lights have to be set up with the exact same pin so they're talking the same language. Make sense? Okay. So you press that ID button again and choose a number and you are good to go. So you can just choose, oftentimes if I'm in a group where there's a lot of photographers, I'll just pick, you know, like one of those, I'll change one of those numbers. Some people, whatever, don't use your bank card number because then all your friends will see and anyway. Um, if you see a red, this is the link light up top here. If that link light is red, your camera transmitter is not uh, communicating with your off-camera flash. There's, it's saying so one of the, either the channel is off or the ID is not correct or some combination or both are off, okay? So that's a, a warning. So once you see that turn green, you know you've got good communication between your, your, your transmitter and your receiving. Uh, flash and you're good to go. Now, if that light turns orange, that's giving you an indication that you're sharing the same frequency and channel with somebody else, meaning it's a submaster. Won't affect how the you know how triggering works. Both of you can use the same thing, uh, but it's saying, hey, you may want to change your channel or your ID um, to let you know. Okay. Now, this works on a system where whoever turned on their light first, the transmitting unit, that they will be green, and then whoever turned it on next is orange, up to however many people are around you. I mean, so, and then if, I, if that first person turned their green light off, or their, their, their transmitter, then whoever turned it on next, it would, that, theirs would turn green, and everybody else's would still stay orange. It's, it's pretty uh, in, in, intuitive that way. Now, uh, how do you know which of your units is set up for receiving and which one is set up for uh, transmitting? Well, if, it is, if, you're, if your window there is orange, you're set up for receiving. This is straight out of the box. If you, you can change this if you want uh, from green to orange uh, if you prefer. But the, the, if you have a green screen out, uh, out of the box, it's set to be a transmitter. And you'll know that by looking at it. Just, just a visual way of looking at it to tell you that... Um, so you know, like you're scanning the room and you can see which ones are, are, are on transmitting. If one's not firing, you, that would be one of the first things you want to look at. Okay, on-camera flash. Now we're going to go into just a little bit, I talked a little bit about the wireless. Um, we're going to go more into that a little bit, but I want to talk to you first about what you can do with on-camera flash, very simple stuff, and still create that dimension that we're looking for. Okay, this is not that. This is on-camera flash, you like, straight at the subject, it basically is a snapshot. Does it look bad? Debatable, you know? You ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers. Uh, but one thing that's interesting, if you're going to point the flash on camera right at your subject, you may want to consider maybe taking the zoom head. Now, this flash, like most speed lights, will, can, has the ability to zoom and narrow the cone of light that, that comes out of it. Uh, so what you can do is zoom that head manually um, and get a little bit of a different, uh, like a spotlight look where you're, it's, it's falling off of your subject. And you get a little bit of a, just a different feel there. And here's a quick look at what that looks like 
uh, from camera's position off you know, of what that looks like. So you can see the fall off uh, from her chest down. It goes pretty dark. Uh, it's still an option. Okay. Now, here's the shower curtain. All right. All we did was just hang a shower curtain. You could, you could gaff tape it to a wall. You could put it on a boom arm or a, a broomstick. I don't care what. Have somebody hold it. You know, whatever. Now, just aim it enough off camera so that there's very little, if any, light traveling forward. Because if there's some light traveling forward, you're going to end up having two light sources, one from camera and the bulk of it coming from off camera. Make sense? So what you can do if you want, let me do this for you real quick. If we were to put this flash on camera, and I'm photographing you again, and the, let's just say the, 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 the shower curtain is over here. I don't want any of this light traveling forward toward you, so I want to make sure this is enough this way so that I'm not having any of that light hit forward. You could also take a little card, or you can just take your hand and put it there in front of it so that you're blocking any light from going forward. That's a real quick way of getting around it if you are experiencing that. OK, uh, so wait, so back. You can see um, the flash head is zoomed a little bit here. And the, it's just illuminating like half of that shower curtain. But we're still getting a decent soft light from it. And we, of course, we have a reflector on the other side. And here's a look with that same setup with no reflector. Uh, contrast is a little, you know, she's a blonde, but if she was a brunette, you'd get a lot more fall off over here. Um, but you can tell from this that there was no reflector used just by looking at the catch lights in her eyes. If you go up closely and look at it, there's no catch light on that other side of the eye. And that's oftentimes how you can tell what the lighting situation was. Now, I just, all I did was add a reflector. You can tell her hair brightened up a little bit here. And you can also tell on the 3 o'clock position on her eye, you can see there's a catch light there. That's from the reflector. Now, you could use a, 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 a metallic type reflector, which will kick a little bit more light in. Or you could use a white, which will, a white reflector, which will be a lot softer. Oftentimes, you'll have to move white reflectors or a V-flat or something like that closer to your subject to really have it take effect. So white isn't as punchy, of course, as like a silver or a mix of gold and silver. So again, narrow beam of light creates more contrast on the model because the light source is smaller. Same thing we talked about earlier. So there's that, whoops, there's that narrow beam. And then here's a quick look. Reflector, no reflector. But again, small light source. And what I did was I zoomed. This is at the flash zoomed out to 200, and you saw that amount of light that hit the, the uh, shower curtain. This, I zoomed ahead out to 20, and we've got a, a broader light source, a softer light source um, hitting her. So that's, you can do that just by changing the zoom on the, on the flash head. OK, off-camera flash. This is really where I would like you to be, because it's easier to deal with, and you don't have to worry about as much um, you know, getting the light right the way you want it. So you have to set up the transmitter. And the nice thing about the transmitter, the STE3RT transmitter, is it looks the same as the back of the flash. So if you know one, you know the other. Very, very simple to work. And then so you can control everything right from here. Now, you, if you like dealing with making changes inside the menu system on the camera from the LCD of the camera, you can do it there as well. I prefer doing it here because I, I just it's, it's quicker for me. But you choose whatever you want. Decide what you want on the portrait lighting. Again, this goes into figuring out, OK, what style am I going to use? What's going to be most flattering on my subject? All those questions should be answered. And that comes into as far as preparation before the portrait. Uh, is it going to be harsh, soft, or maybe somewhere in the middle? You know, Those are some questions you should know. You should never go into a portrait session not knowing what you're going to do. And sometimes that happens. And it's not always optimal, but if you can think quickly on your feet and make quick decisions based on, like if you just met your subject two minutes ago, you got to come up with something. So knowing and studying people's faces and what type of light is going to work best on their fa face 
is it just comes with time and no and experimentation and photographing just getting in NASCAR they call it seat time it's basically getting in in the trenches and doing it after you do a lot of it you're going to start knowing and learning what's going to be better on one subject versus another so with one light, again, there's a lot of options available. And you'll notice on, on the images you looked at earlier with one light, did you notice that that background, that was, which was a white background, the background was actually turning gray. Anybody know why? Shutter speed? Fall off? Yes, fall off is correct. Uh, because it has everything to do with the, the source of light and the distance between that and the background. And I'll show you some examples here. But think about the use of reflectors for either adding an additional highlight, as I showed you in that last uh, split from the model, uh, to add either additional highlights, or you, know, you could use a reflector as a gobo or a go-between to hide other lights that perhaps, you know, if you're in an office building and you've got lights that are coming from overhead that you can't turn off, uh, they're just, you know, there's no way, they're just on all the time, uh, you can use a reflector to block some of that light. And oftentimes, those lights are fluorescent based, and they will cast a green color of light onto your subject. And you want to avoid that at all costs, because green light from fluorescent lights is just the worst possible thing to correct, especially if you're putting white light, daylight balanced light from your flash onto your subject. And then you've got a mix of fluorescent light hitting them as well. You get this green hue that takes over the image, and it just looks like dog meat. You don't want to deal with it if you don't have to. OK, so here's direct flash on the subject. Again, really harsh. We've learned about harsh light already. There's always a reason to use this uh, in the right particular situation, but it's not something that I would say I use regularly. It, it depends. But here's what that looked like. You've seen that already. If you have something that looks like this, and you're saying, gosh, you know, it's the only picture I have, uh, and it just doesn't look good, what can I do to make it better? Turn it black and white. You know what I mean? Uh, you'll often find this if you have an image that you took that's too noisy or too much grain. Maybe perhaps it's underexposed. Turn it to black and white, and all of a sudden now it's art. <laughs> you know? So you'll be amazed. I looked at a lot of images that I just hated in color but loved them in black and white. So just try it. OK. Uh, now, back to the shower curtain. Now, instead of bouncing off the shower curtain, we're going to go through the shower curtain and diffuse that light a little more. Uh, this particular shot was at 200 millimeters. The flash was zoomed to 200. So a small cone of light, as you can see, is coming out of there. Now, in a normal situation, if I was to take a, uh, like a regular softbox and put it up to there, about the same surface area is illuminated in that particular image as what a, soft, a normal medium softbox would give me. Um, but we've got a lot more surface area here. So take a look at this. There's the flash. I'm just shooting it right through. And the reason you're, not, you're still seeing the, the background there is kind of gray, right? Even though we know it's a white background, it's looking gray because there's very little light hitting it. But watch what happens. Uh, again, we talked about this. Distance from the background or light fall off is what causes that background to go gray. But let's say you only have one light. Let me just, I'll share with that in a minute to how you can make that background pure white using this setup with just one light. So that's what that image looks like. You see, we've, it, it's, it's nice. It's, it's fairly soft light, right? Um, you can tell there's no reflector in this particular image, even though you see it in, the, in the, the, the set shot. But I'm looking at the eyes there, and I don't see another catch light there. So I know there's no reflector on that shot. So again, background turns gray. And then now. Look what we did here. I, I spread the light out, to the zoom head, to 20 millimeters. And it's going beyond the shower curtain and striking the white background. You'll see this little shadow line right here. This shadow line on the floor, that's the shadow from the curtain. So we've got soft light hitting her and hard light hitting the background. And there's, it's, the background you want to be brighter so it becomes pure white. Right? So flashes at 20 millimeters. I moved the flash head back a little bit, so I was illuminating almost the entire shower curtain, very soft light. And um, here's, here's what it looked like. 
And this is what you expe would expect to see with multiple lights. You know, if you were to do this shot in a studio and you had unlimited lights, you'd put maybe one light on the right side, one light on the left side on the background to make that pure white, and then add your softbox into your subject and maybe a hair lighter if you wanted to. Um, but with one light, we've made that background pure white. And you can't do that with a softbox because the, it's all soft coming out of it. And that fall off is going to create an issue. Now, if you were to take the softbox and peel the, the edge off where the one edge of the, the diffusion material is striking the model and then the other part of it, the hard light part of it, is striking the background, you'd achieve something like this. But shower curtain is $3. This works really well, and it, it's not sexy, but it works. Okay, any questions on that? Good? Um, so we can, previously, the light was bouncing against the curtain, and now it's behind. Yeah, so the question was, uh, in the previous uh, example, the light I, I showed you with the flash on camera bouncing, shooting into the white curtain. So basically, let's just assume it's a white wall. And let's say this is the wall here, and I'm shooting the light that way to create a larger source of light. And that light then is what's illuminating my subject. On this one, I took the light behind the shower curtain, and now I've created a, a big diffusion panel. And go ahead. So the difference between the, the background and the softness of the shadow. So I mean, uh, the two situations, the difference between the two situations is the, the background. In the second situation, the background was white. Right. So, OK, so here, I'll, I'll repeat it. So I know, what you're, I know where you're headed now. OK, so he was saying, OK, the background was a little gray on the shot where we bounced the light into the shower curtain. And there wasn't a whole lot of light getting t to strike the background. So that's why that white background went a shade of gray. I could make that, and you're going to see that here, uh, with a grid. If you don't put light on your background, it's going to be black if you're using any kind of strobe or speed light or anything like that where the, the flash duration is, is short. Um, continuous light is a little different story. You'd have to make all that light shade so there's no, again, same concept where there's no light hitting the background. Uh, but that's basically th what you're talking about. So when we, when we took the light behind, the shower curtain, and then part of that light was skipping by, and that was illuminating at a much brighter factor than what was hitting the subject. That's what made the background brighter. And what about the shadow on our face? The shadow on the face, you're gonna, you would see, uh, again, with that shower curtain going through, it's a large source of light. I took the speed light to 20 millimeters, so that almost that entire uh, shower curtain was illuminated. Very, very soft light. You saw when I zoomed the head in, it was still a nice light, but there was more contrast with that. I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong. They're just different types of, of illumination. Now, if, again, if, getting back to if somebody has a lot of texture on their face um, and you don't want to show that texture, a big, soft light would be your, in a lot of cases, not every, but in a lot of cases, if that's what you're going for, the answer to that. If you want to hide things that you don't have to want to retouch later, that's the way to go. Now, if you, if you have some guy that's maybe got a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, wrinkles on his face and you want to show that texture for, for, for aesthetic reasons, then harder light is going to be your answer on that. The answer to everything is it depends. You just need more space. Right. So, OK, so moving on. Um, now I've added a grid onto this light, all right? And you'll notice the background is going way, way darker because there's no light hitting it. it. This is all about painting with light. If I want something in the background to show, I've got to put light on it, whether it be white light or a colored gel or something like that, or just, you know, if you want to see something back there, you have to light it. It's like painting. If you just paint a portrait of somebody and don't put a paint anything in the background, it's just gonna, you're just going to see the, the painting of the subject, not the background. You've got, to, you've got to add chunks of light where you want the light to be, to, to be able to see. So your eye, the viewer's eye goes where you want it to, but 
you know, you're, you're seeing what I'm here. Look at the background here. It's not black, but it's pretty close. It's actually a, you know, a, a really, really deep gray. But, you know, that's what that light type of light is doing. Now, what I've done, if you'll notice, I'm not taking that light and pointing it toward the background. There's a term called feathering light, and that's basically just taking the light and moving it. So when you have that grid on there, you'll see it. Um, and it's a lot easier to see with a, with a continuous light source than it is with flash. But once you've done enough, you can basically look at the grid and you start stepping off center from that grid. If you can't see any of the white diffusion material from an angle, then that's, you're good. So, uh, but if you start seeing white light, that white light's going to come through uh, some of the white diffusion material through there. It's just like at, when you're at the uh, you know, you're out, outside and you're at the, the street light there and you see the do not walk sign. There's a grid on those in most cases. As soon as you go off center from that, you don't see the do not walk sign. Same concept. Except this is prettier. So, so that's what the grid looks like. A grid, um, there's a lot of light modifiers that you can add a grid option to. Grids aren't necessarily cheap but they are a very effective way of controlling that light. Uh, and and that's, it's not necessarily something you're going to use every time, but it, I'll say, for, for instance, if you're going to use any kind of gels, colored gels, uh, on a background, let's just say we had a subject wearing red, and we wanted to add a red background to that. If you take white light from your speed light and you have that striking the background, what's going to happen to that red color? It's like mixing paint. If you mix white paint with red paint, what do you got? Pink. So you're going to start to like really cutting out the intensity of that red color by simply having white light from the strobe hit that background. So that's where grids come in. You, you turn that light and you feather it away from the background, and all of a sudden that color starts coming alive. That's a topic that we're really going to cover on the next part of this series, probably in July. We're going to work out the date, but just keep it tuned. Um, but we're going to use more gels so you can really get a, a, a good feel for how they really work uh, in a shooting environment. And that's anywhere. I mean, you know, it's all about painting with light, really. Uh, and I, I don't, when I say painting with light, I'm not talking about long exposures. Just lighting what chunks of what you want. OK, so a couple other ter terrific modifiers. I, I told you at the onset that I love this Westcott Halo, it's basically a shoot-through umbrella with backing on it, so all of the power from the speed light goes forward. The, these speed lights are not, they don't, they're not like, you know, studio packs where you've got like a thousand watts of light or 500 watts of light. And using them efficiently is the key. So with high ISO available that is amazing on these cameras today, uh, you can get a lot out of a little from speed lights. I use speed lights now way more than I do anything else because I know how to use them efficiently. If you shoot every, your ISO at 100, you're going to be replacing batteries constantly. You don't need 100 for most things. You know, everybody's idea of what acceptable noise is or digital noise is different. Some people will say, I can't shoot anything over 500 ISO. Okay, that's fine. Just expect to Go through more batteries, that's all. Do so. have a ceiling of the ISO? Do I have, the question is, do I have a ceiling of the ISO that I use? Um, it depends on the camera. The newer the camera, the higher that ceiling gets. Okay, the 5D Mark IV on the table here, my ceiling is 12,800. I produced 40 by 60 images at 12,800 ISO. They look beautiful. And if they come to a point where they're maybe a, a bit underexposed and I'm seeing more, um, more uh, noise than I'd like, maybe I turn it black and white. And I, it's now art, right? So, uh, but everybody's idea is different. You know, with the 5D Mark III, my ceiling was 6,400. It's, it's, and it, of course, if I go to like the 7D Mark II, it's an it's a APS-C size sensor, so the sensor's smaller. And... Um, my ceiling is a little lower. My ceiling with the 7D Mark II now is 6,400. But it doesn't mean that I won't shoot over that. But I, I'm not comfortable 
in a regular portrait scenario going over that, those numbers. But I will if I have to. I'd rather get the image and have it be noisy than not get it at all. Because I can deal with noise later. You know? So, okay. So one thing, uh, you can use this light, this Westcott Halo. In fact, I think there's some catalogs in the back here because the last speaker uh, was sponsored by uh, Westcott and they, have some, they left some, some catalogs back there. Uh, but you can get away with one speed light in a box, but they also make this thing called the Westcott Triple Threat, which allow you to put three lights in there and you get basically more, you fill the entire umbrella with light, so making your light source a little large. Now you're saying, all right, that's a lot of money tied up in, 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 a, in a softbox. Uh, and OK, but I'm just saying these are the options that are available for you. But I often use this when I'm going outside, because if I use, and it's a whole other class, but if I do a class on high-speed sync, um, where you need more speed lights to make these flashes efficient, um, I will, I've used as many as six in a speed light softbox. Um, the answer to everything is it depends. So, but here's that, that's that light. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful light. And the great thing is, is again, without, we talked about making the background brighter or, or dimmer, or like gray or white. Um, you can do that with this light as well by feathering the light toward the background. So you're just using a portion of the light or that modifier to light the subject. And then the other portion is aimed more toward the background. Typically, I'll have this light. You'll see that it's not necessarily aimed right at her face. It's aimed a little bit feathered back toward the camera. And then that way, I can use my reflector to fill in the other side. But if I want to um, have the background brighter, I'll aim it. I'll turn that, the, 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 the shaft of the umbrella toward the background. And I'm using a different portion of the umbrella to illuminate my subject. And the reflector can still stay where it is. And it works. So that's why one of the, that's one of my favorite lights. It's very versatile. I can use it in just about any situation. Unless the only one I don't use that for is gels because it spreads lights everywhere. And I, I need that control of having grids on a, on a softbox to be able to control that light. Now, this is called the Westcott uh, Apollo Orb. And this is basically a flat front softbox. It's, it's fairly large. And it, this is the closest thing, I think, that, that em emulates window light. Um, now, again, the relative size of this box to the subject, you know, it's very, very soft here. When I'm, when I'm this close, you move it back, and it starts getting more contrasty. So those shadows get deeper. So you can do a lot. Now, uh, this is called the Westcott Rapid Box up here. And I, this is one of my other favorite lights, because it, it, it folds down into a nice little compact compartment. And it's very closely, uh, it gives you the quality of a, of a beauty dish. And it doesn't weigh a lot. And you can mount a, a speed light right on it. And I'll use this type of thing for uh, butterfly lighting, where I've got the light on a boom. Uh, oftentimes, if I don't have a boom with me, a boom arm, I can, you, it's, it's light enough where you can just hand hold it over your camera. Uh, I wouldn't do all day like that, but you can get away with it. Um, and then for the reflector, you could either have it on a stand or just have the model sit and hold it in her lap and bring it higher or lower, depending on how much reflector fill you want. OK. And there you can see, uh, at the 6 o'clock position in her eye, you can see uh, the reflector catch light. So that's how you can study a lot by looking at eyes. Quick question. So the question was, OK, what if somebody's wearing sunglasses? Now, it's not a very common thing for a, a, a headshot. But I could see like, an actor maybe doing that as part of, or a model as part of their, their comp card. Um, and if you see a catch light, you're not going to see a catch light in their eye because their eyes are pretty much shaded by the sunglasses. But what do you see if you see the catch light in the glasses? Um, it would depend aesthetically, in my opinion, if you want that reflection. Maybe that is uh, you want one catch light in there so that's like kind of aesthetically part of the image. Mm -hmm. um, but 
it's not like there's no hard and fast rule in my book as far as removing it or not. If it's distracting enough, mm -hmm. then you remove it. The one thing I will say uh, about a catch light in the eye or in, the, in a reflection of the glasses <laughs> is if you have a soft box and you can see the shape of the soft box or an umbrella or something like that, that then kind of gives it away mm -hmm. and it looks distracting. So oftentimes I would probably remove that. Um, it depends. Mm -hmm. I hate to keep saying that, but it, it, the answer, again, is it depends. So, okay. Uh, now, the last thing is this, um, the uh, Rogue Flash Bender. And these things are great because they can, they're basically, they, they lay flat. And they're only about this big. This is the large, the extra large uh, version of the Flash Bender. And it has that little uh, diffusion fabric that Velcro right on. So you're shooting light up into this thing and you have to spread it out a little bit so that there's room for light to bounce around and illuminate the entire surface of the, uh, the front fabric there. Um, but it works great. You have to be fairly close to your subject because again the relative size of this to the subject is it's fairly small. Uh, but you'll see here um, this is the loop lighting option, but this is, this is basically with a reflector, without it, but that's the quality of light you get with it. And I would challenge most anybody to say that that looks bad in any way. If I move it further back, uh, you see, you know, you would get obviously more look, even with a reflector, you would get more of a, a, a hard shadow um, on, the res on the shadow side of their face. But for me, when you're working with such a small light source like this, you really need, in most cases, a reflector to fill that light in because it is kind of small. But for those that are traveling around doing stuff, if you're, you know, you can throw it right in your luggage bag and it lays flat and it's, it's a really good solution if you don't want to travel with a lot of stuff. Okay, um, workflow. There's a lot of, when I say workflow, I'm not necessarily talking about post-processing and a lot of stuff like that. Um, although that's a big part of it, what I would say, I'm going to change this up a little bit, and I'll say one thing I like to do, and it's my way is not the only way, is I like to have my subjects see their images as they're coming off the camera. You're going to get a lot of people that will, you know, that will say, ugh, I hate that. Have you ever listened to yourself on an audio recording? Do you hate it? Yeah. yeah. But everybody else is used to hearing you, your voice, and how it is normally, and they don't complain about it. It's just a, a thing that we have. Well, the same thing when you look at your own photograph. And I think part of the reason is that our entire lives, we've, we've spent looking into a mirror and seeing things the way that the mirror produces our reflection. And when you see a photograph, it's a complete mirror image of the mirror, the, the thing that you've been looking at for all these years. So it's different. So if you wear your part this way in your hair, what you're seeing on a photograph is different than what you're looking at in the mirror every day. Something isn't quite right. So you can't put your finger on it, but it just doesn't look right. And that and vanity, you know, everybody always likes tearing apart the way they look. But you don't look as bad as you think, trust me. All right. <laughs> so, uh, but I like to shoot either, now with the 5D Mark IV, I, I, what I'll do is I'll carry my iPad with me and I'll shoot wirelessly right to that and the images come up and I can say, look, here's the series, tell me which one you like. And they're just, oh, I like that one. It's speed. And we're in a fast paced world now. Digital, we want, the whole idea is in most cases, you want things done quickly. Yesterday. I need it yesterday. It's just a faster workflow. Um, now, some people will say, I don't want to show anything that's not retouched in some way. Well, okay, I get that. And there's a reason to do that, and it depends on the situation. But in a lot of cases, maybe perhaps you're going and photographing um, a group of attorneys or accountants or whatever. You're photographing a whole office of people. Um, and you don't have, you know, why would you want to retouch every single image that you did and waste time on images that they're not even going to buy where they will only need one? Most people can look at an image and say, you know what, I like the expression of that, let's go with that one. And then you can go back and do your retouching. 
Now, I realize presentation styles may vary, but let's just assume that you, you need things yesterday. I shoot raw almost exclusively because of the latitude. Now, in most cases, if you're going to be doing these headshots, you could totally get away with doing JPEG and have perfectly acceptable images. Uh, but if you need to tweak an image or maybe the white balance isn't quite right and you need to tweak that, and it looked good in your camera, but maybe when you get it in your computer that's, that's color calibrated, maybe it doesn't look as good as it should. Well, RAW will allow you to change those, whereas if you did it on a JPEG, it's like a, you know, it's an instant thing. Basically, all, that, all the settings that you had in the camera are baked into that JPEG file. So it's harder to really change that file. Well, it's impossible to change that file without doing any damage to it because this, the JPEGs are compressed. If you take an image, you save it, it compresses it and saves it again. But you, can't, you don't have that latitude uh, that you do with a RAW file. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it. That's my way of doing it. And that's a lot of people's way of doing it because it's a safety net. If your exposures are off for some reason, you've got latitude in the RAW file where you can save it. Uh, whereas a JPEG, you may end up having some trouble. Retouch as soon as possible once they've chosen the image, and I do that usually either the same day or that night and get them to them the next day if I can, even if they didn't ask for it the next day, because I'd rather over, over deliver than over promise. Because as soon as you say, I'll have it to you tomorrow, if you deliver it two days from now, they'll be like, you didn't deliver it on time. You know? And that's a reason for them to say, mm, maybe we should try somebody else. Yes? Do I, do I ever, the question is, do I ever suggest to a client what needs to be retouched? Well, <laughs> that's a, that could be a very slippery slope because you could say to somebody, you know, that thing on your forehead really should go. Uh, you don't want to offend anybody, okay? Uh, so this is why I suggest, you know, it's not, <laughs> my wife always says this to me, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, and there's, there's merit to that, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's why I asked them, are there any concerns that you have with your image here? And, they'll, and hopefully, if they're honest with you, they will say, yes, I don't like that thing on my forehead. Would you take care of that for me? Sure. Sometimes people will have a scar that they want to get rid of. Or perhaps they would say, and I've had this happen, where somebody would say to me, you know what, don't remove this scar. I removed a scar, and I delivered an image to them. They said, oh my gosh, you took out the scar on Johnny. Why did you do that? That's like a really important scar to him. You know. Like, I thought I was doing them a favor, but no, it, it turns out. So that's why I always ask, but you have to be very subtle in how you ask it. So is there anything that concerns you about, you know, your final image, how you'd like it to look, you know, and, and hopefully they'll be honest with you and, and tell you. Sure. Good question, though. Okay, so uh, I do my own retouching, but if I have a ton of it and I don't have the time to do it all, um, I'll, you know, outsource it to a service bureau company like retouchup.com or something. They do a really good job uh, if you have a lot of images and you just don't have the time to do them. Um, that's a really good service. Uh, I'm sorry? How much do you need to charge? They're very reasonable. Like, a couple bucks a head, I think. Yeah. And it's not much at all for what they deliver. It's, you know, I'm sure there's different, there's different levels of service. Uh, but check it out. They're, 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 uh, I have never heard a bad thing about them. And I don't, they don't pay me to say that. I'm just saying if I find something good and it works, I use it. Same thing with like the Westcott modifiers. I, they don't pay me anything. They don't give me anything for free. I use them because I like what they do. And they're reasonably priced and, you know, it's just a good thing. When you retouch uh, for clients and stuff like that, do you keep the original in one change so you can go back? Okay, the question is when I, when I retouch, do I keep the original and then the change that I made? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, I, I never get rid of my raw files. I've got stacks of hard drives with catalogs telling me what's on them. Uh, I'm delivering usually JPEGs. Uh, if, if it's for a commercial client or something and they have, it's going to be like for a print ad, they'll probably want TIFF files. 
and you can, you know, it's always a good idea to ask, okay, what's the final delivery? What's the output here? Where are you putting this? Is it for web, uh, for your website, or is it going to be in a print ad or an annual report, something like that, that's printed? Um, you need to know those things ahead of time so that you can deliver what their, uh, whoever's doing the printing, what their workflow is, what, they, what files do they need. Uh, so if you deliver, if you, if you take care of those things ahead of time, answer those questions and deliver what you want the first, what they want the first time, it, they're going to have you back. So good question. Did I answer the question for you that way? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. I want to make sure I answered it. <laughs> uh, so whether you're delivering files or prints, um, you know, again, find out what they want. Don't, I mean, we're in an age now where delivering digital files is very common. So, you know, back in the film days, it was like, oh my gosh, you're going to sell your negative to them? It was like unheard of, or even in the early days of digital. I can't believe you were selling your files. I, you know, you, print. Well, that's not really what everybody needs necessarily. So I'll get to your question in a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, Dropbox is one of my favorite things to vehicles to get high resolution images because if you send um, full res 300 pixel per inch images to somebody's corporate mailbox. Like I know at Canon, if you try to do that, it's going to oftentimes either flood their email, email, email box limit over the edge where, you know, it, it'll kick it back and say, I don't think so. Uh, or, you know, it's going to take them a while to download it it's easier to put them on a service like this where they can download the images straight to their hard drive rather than flooding somebody's email box with a lot of images. Because sometimes like corporations have limits on what file size you can actually send to them and then they never get them and you think that it was actually delivered and it wasn't. So communication is a really good thing to have with your clients as well. Follow up. And that's one of my, one of my things. Follow up. It's good for business. It doesn't cost anything to call them and say, hey, did you get the files I just sent you? Are they okay? That makes you look good. You, you, nobody can, can criti criticize you for following up. Just don't be a pest in their, you know, in the thorn in their side. Okay, uh, a couple of business points here. I'm not going to go crazy with this because that's a whole other class. But a funny thing happens when you don't market yourself. <laughs> Nothing. Be out there in your community and be that person that everybody knows. And not for a bad reason. <laughs> you know, um, you've got to get your face out there, get some really great business cards, and be a specialist. If you want to do headshots, be a specialist in headshots. Now, you could, have, you could be a specialist in headshots. You could be a specialist in children's photography. You could be a specialist in whatever you want. Have a different business card for every one of those specialties that you do. Because people like people who are specialists and what they want to know ahead of time that you're the person I want to go to for this because this is what you specialize in. Years ago, there was a, there was a photographer that I, I knew, uh, and he had a, a studio in a city. And on one block, it was John Doe's fine portraiture. And on the other block, it was pixie portraits. And they were joined in the middle with the same workspace. Two different levels of product, same photographer. And it was, you know, it's just, you don't, you don't sell a Honda Civic for the price as, as it costs for a higher end Honda product, right? So specialize in what you want. Like it, I, I have a card that, that's for business stuff, for portraits, headshots like this, and then I have, we have other stuff for children's portraits and families and everything else. Um, but be out there, market yourself. You don't, if you don't have any business, ask for it. Go be a part of your community. And what we did in our town was we went to, we, we started a thing with the community center and we, we ran a business portrait special for those businesses that were local to my town. 
and we went out and we said, okay, here's where we're going to be. Schedule it, come on by, and we'll, and we gave a really d reasonable price portrait for that day because we were, we were trying to get our name out into our community. And we had a good number of people show up that ordinarily would never have ever been exposed to our, our services. What was that price? I'm not going to discuss prices no? here, okay. no. No, because it's not the right, because it doesn't mean anything. Everybody's price is different and yeah. it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's, it's almost irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What I will say is, I'll share with this to you at, at the end again, but don't price yourself too little because it, it brings the entire market down as a whole. Um, now, I understand you're like, oh my gosh, Eric, you know, I have no business, I need some business, and if I price my product at, you know, a really, really attractive price, uh, everybody will get it. Well, not necessarily. Early on in my career, I had, when I was doing weddings, I met with a bride and a groom and their parents at, at, her, at her house. And they loved everything. The sales, it was going great. The relationship was built. We had, and they were like, yeah, this is awesome. We love what you do. And when I walked out to my car with the father of the bride, uh, I was like, so, you know, I'll send you the contract this week. And, and he's like, I'm sorry, we're, we're not going to be able to use you. And I was floored. I was like, okay, why? What's, what's going on? And he said, well, your, your, your price is too cheap. There's something wrong with it. I almost lost it. I was like, I went home and I like. Say, okay, I'll make it higher. Well, no, the, the, the moment was over. It, does, it didn't matter, you know? So perception is everything. And be that person that is the consummate professional and, and, and deliver it. If you can't deliver it, then you got to work on your craft a little bit. You got to start somewhere, and that's why a lot of you are here. And this is great that you're learning this stuff. Um, but you've got to practice, practice, practice. Um, photograph your kids until they get so annoyed with you, or your neighbors, you know, whatever it is. But know ahead of time what that image is going to look like before you even take it. With regards to technical things, expression is different because that's. You know, that comes on, this, on, on a you know, very, very spur of the moment thing. And, you know, that's, it's always good. If you ever get a chance uh, to take a class, um, I, th I think there's a group called Toastmasters. Anybody ever hear of this? OK. Um, you're like, what does that have to do with photography? Well, it kind of has everything to do with photography. It's about speaking in public. And whether you're speaking in front of one person or 500 people, it's, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's about how you relate to those people and what you can pull out of them at the time you want. And you only need them to look good for a 60th of a second. That's it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but getting back to this, oh, you had one question, but I, want, I will take it at the end here if you don't mind, because I want to finish this up and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, but yeah, again, ask around your town for like when I, when digital first got really popular uh, actually before it even got popular because I had a camera uh, called the Kodak DCS 560 and that it was a six and a half megapixel camera and it was twenty five thousand dollars it was an expensive camera and I bought it and my friends thought I was nuts and I said well look I'm gonna make it pay for itself quickly because I have to <laughs> you know so I, as I said, I went into Philadelphia and I went up to some of the, the high-rise buildings and I went to all the accountants' offices and attorneys and everything that I could find and I knocked on their door the old-fashioned way and I said, hey, I would love to, to, to photograph your attorneys or accountants or whatever staff you have here that you need because everybody needs a headshot. Even back then, they just didn't know it yet. Um, and not everybody was a taker, but you, it's like, you know how we hang up on telemarketers all the time? We're like, oh my god, I, 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 no, I don't want it. But they know, and they don't get like, offended by it, because they know that it's going to take tw 20 callers for them, 20 no's for them to get a yes. But they're going to get a yes. It's just a numbers game. So I went and I did this, and I paid for that camera in a month. Wow. 
because I, nobody else would, was, could do it. I would go home. I didn't know anything about Photoshop. I did the best I could. But I was delivering high-res files the next day when nobody else was doing it. And that alone <laughs> launched my headshot business. So, uh, and that was when, <laughs> that, I don't want to hear anybody complain about memory card prices or not because 212 megabyte, 212 megabyte cards were 500 bucks. All right, so uh, yeah. Now, I mean, gosh, SanDisk just sent me a 100 and something, 125 gigabyte card or whatever it was. You know, I, I can't believe how much you can fit on a little memory card now. Um, my mother pulled out a one gigabyte card the other day. I'm like, I forgot. I, I thought I brought a card to what my sister was in town, and and I said, oh, shoot, I forgot a card. And she says, I think I have one. So she pulls out this one gigabyte card. I said, I'm going to fit like three images on that. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, but it was it was all I needed, and it worked. So anyway, um, network constantly. I you know I can't stress this enough. Be the person and don't be afraid to go into your town and ask people for business. They don't even know they need a headshot, but if you present it to them in the right way, you're going to get a lot of no's, but you're going to get some yeses too. And that's how you start building your rapport with your, with your, your, your town. And just start there. And then everybody's going to start to get to know you. Go um, hang out where you think your clients are going to be. Who do you want as a client? Have you defined who you want as a client? for a headshot? It's just a question. If you don't know that, you should know that. Charity. Get involved with charity because those people have a lot of connections. And if they like you, they will talk about you. And you will get business. You, you can bet the farm that if you give some free stuff to a charity and just be there for them and do what they need and provide that service to them because you're not looking for a tax break, but you're looking to give back to the community or whatever, whatever the charity is that may be special to you. Do it because you will get paid back tenfold in what, you, in what, you, what you've given. And again, it's all about the relationship, right? So develop those relationships. <coughs> Hang out, I told you this before, hang out where your customers would, you think it would be. Like, you know, if you're, if you want to do headshots for prominent people in your neighborhood or in your, in your city, who are those prominent people? Where do they hang out? What do they do? do they, are they at the golf club? Probably. Um, maybe go to the golf club and say to the owners there, uh, look, I want to photograph your staff. No charge. Let's, let's develop some ideas and get those people known to uh, the people that hang out there. And then maybe once you develop that relationship, the, the owner of the golf course says, I got this great guy who does, or girl who does portraits that, you know, you never know. All these business meetings happen on the golf course, right? You hear this stuff? Try me. Try it. So, uh, and then... Have you ever heard of this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? Dale Carnegie is a master, and, or was a master. I don't think he's alive anymore. Uh, but a great book to read. Uh, if you have any trepidations about dealing with people and you're just uncomfortable, read this book. And there are a lot of techniques in there that will help you Broaden your wings a little bit. It's a great book. Okay, now for a little more on some of the stuff that you know, the stuff that we do here at B and H um, is great. I, again, I, I told you about education. I'm in our education department at Canon, and I love to teach. I love to get other instructors in B and H for us to teach here. And uh, but if you want to just tool around at home, if you've never been to the Canon Digital Learning Center. It's a completely free website. There's all kinds of great education on here. And while the, the web address is a little lengthy, um, it's learn.usa.canon.com. If you just Google it, Canon Digital Learning Center, it'll take you there.
it's a great place. Uh, there's all kinds of articles, uh, videos, technical stuff on new cameras that are coming out. Um, we do a blog. Uh, I, this good-looking guy right here does some uh, articles for it's me, by the way. <laughs> Have your own headshot done, by the way, people. Get your own headshot. Because you know what? You, how are you going to sell somebody else on your great stuff if you don't have one? Okay? But here, tons of stuff here. Um, there's also, if you're interested in, in um, most, of the, well, all of the Canon Digital Learning Center uh, website stuff is free. Uh, there are a couple of paid online courses here. Uh, there's actually more than a couple. There's, this is just one page of them, but there's a lot of good stuff there that you can go and on speed lights and photographing children and landscape stuff. There's all kinds of stuff. Go check it out. Uh, that's shop.usa.canon.com. And then um, contact stuff. If, if, uh, if you want to get a message to me at Canon, I'm not going to give you my web address because this is going to be broadcast everywhere and I'll get flooded email, email, email box. But if you want, uh, the, on the Canon Digital Learning Center, you can hit the contact us button. It's all the way at the bottom. If you want to send me a message or anybody else in our department a message, you can do that and it will get siphoned over to me and I'll reply to you. Uh, my Instagram is stones underscore PA. Uh, you can check me out there. Um, there's some of my work up there, but drop by and say hi. You know, I'd love to develop more relationships with, with our end users. So um, I'm just going to give a little shout out. I, this, this came in my email box yesterday, I think, and it was kind of odd when I was thinking about the class, but uh, have any of you ever been to Petapixel's website? Peta, Petapixel, P-E-T-A, yeah. Pixel. Uh, anyway, uh, this, um, this author, uh, his name's Gavin Doran, D-O-R-A-N, Doran, Doran. Um, he wrote this, this little article, says, 10 things you should never do as a photographer. And I, I thought, you know, that piqued my interest, so I'm like, all right, I gotta, I gotta teach him tomorrow. I, mean, I think this would be good. And some of these things, uh, of course, Will, will be repetitive, but uh, the first thing is, um, and again, the title is 10 Things You Should Never Do, all right? Number one is steal another photographer's work. Okay, Captain Obvious here, right? But, uh, but people have done it, and you know, they find a photographer maybe whose work they really love, and they, maybe they took an image and say, all right, I don't have any great images, but here's a great image and um, you start marketing yourself with that, eventually it will catch up to you. Don't ever do that. Uh, be disingenuous about the edit. In other words, don't, don't say it's all that or, or try to pump something up that's not really there. Like, you know what I mean? Just be, be real about your stuff. Um, I'm going to skip number three because there's a profanity in there. <laughs> but don't, don't be an S talker. Uh, number four is great, and we talked about this. Never fail to prepare. And there's blurbs about every one of these things. I think you should go and read it. Um, never be impatient. Patience is critical, especially when you're dealing with people that aren't used to being photographed. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable for them. So have a little patience with them. And, and then again, this helps to get you know, your uh, social skills to a level where you can talk to anybody. Uh, that will help them. Because if you're comfortable and you can help make them comfortable, the whole thing's going to work. Um, don't expect work to fall from the sky. <laughs> you know, I'm a great photographer. Everybody's going to just you know, throw money at me doesn't work that way. If it does, please tell me about it, because I would love to know the, the formula for that. Uh, don't over-edit your work. Photoshop is a great thing, but if you over-retouch something to the point where it's like, it doesn't even look real anymore. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a difference, because digital, you know, it could be artistic in that direction. But in a general sense, for uh, since we're talking about you know, headshots and stuff like that. 
unless there's a reason to way overdo it. So if you're going to overdo something, way overdo it and, and do it overly done well. <laughs> but, but for normal stuff, don't, don't over retouch something to where the skin looks like candle wax. Um, you know, it's out there. You can Google all this stuff. It's, it's there. Um, enhance. Don't overdo. Uh, not, don't, don't, well, this is not understand your audience. Well, this goes to understanding your audience, and we talked about that. Know who they are, where they hang out, what they do, what their habits are, what, what, what makes them tick, what is going to get you in front of them and have some sort of a common interest that you can talk to them and help sell you and your service and what you do. Sounds like I'm stating the obvious here, but it's, 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 uh, it's true. Uh, and I talked about this one too, don't charge too little because you're going to then take everybody down with you. It happened in the wedding industry when digital first really got popular and cameras were starting to be affordable and everybody's a photographer now. And the guys that, I mean, there's, there's still an elite group of people uh, that are making a really, really great living at wedding photography, uh, but not everybody can take that chunk of the pie. And then you've got a middle group and then everybody else is fighting for the scraps. But the average price of great wedding photography came way down, way down. And it, it just, you know, and then, Brides are on the, on the web, on some websites, chatting back and forth. Well, oh, I got this photographer for $500 or whatever the price is. And, and all of a sudden, it, you're a commodity now. You're not, like every one of you has a different style and something you bring to the table, whether it's weddings or headshots or whatever you do. So uh, don't get to the point where you sell yourself too short. Because that story I told you earlier about if, if, if you're too cheap, there's something wrong with it. And you, I know, look, we got the mortgage to pay, honey. We got this, that, and the other thing. We got, you know what? And if I bring my prices down, everybody will start booking us. Well, you'll get some, but it's not going to be an overnight fix for you. Um, there's money in being more expensive. Or there, there's, there's magic in being more expensive. <laughs> um, there is money in being more expensive, but you know you don't want to go home and charge too much because then you slice off everything at the head, uh, and nobody will come to you. So, I recommend you know get to a comfortable point and then raise your prices ten to fifteen percent a year, and nobody will ever notice a difference. And then you'll you'll get to a point then where you know you command, and your skill will command that that dollar value, and then um, giving back. Don't not give back. This is talking about the charity stuff and, you know, um, be in front of people that are important in your community. Uh, there was a photographer I knew who decided, and it was, a, it was all PR, but it really launched his career. He uh, ran this program and he wanted to photograph important people uh, making a difference in their community. And he, he turned it into a red carpet event, and the media got involved, they got wind of it, and he had this big, he photographed, I don't know, like 100 people. And he basically printed, uh, you know, large wall portraits of these people and had them on this display at this gallery. And all these people came, the media came, you know, politicians came, it was amazing. And he did it all for free. He would charge, if, if the people wanted the portrait at the end, he would sell it to them. He didn't give it to them at a reasonable price, but, you know, so he, he basically covered for the cost of the show. But man, the PR this guy got was amazing. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's the last thing on this, though. So that was the top 10 of, of uh, I feel like we're on Letterman here, but. Uh, the things you shouldn't do as a photographer. And I just thought that was kind of something I wanted to share with you based on, you know, what we talked about today. Because, yeah, 10% it, it, is technical skills, but 90% of this is up here. And, you know, be approachable. And it's all psychology. It's a lot, almost all psycholo psychology here with, with this. So 
Uh, with that, I want to thank you. We are at 6.02, and I uh, appreciate your time. <laughs>